his art in, in, in relation to, to an income. To that end, Degas was instrumental in organizing the famous series of Impressionist exhibitions of the 1870s. He joined Monet, Pissarro, Sesley, Morisot, Cezanne, and others to form the Société Anonyme des Artistes Pionteurs, Sculpteurs, Graveurs. Its objectives were to exhibit without selection committees, to sell the works exhibited, and to publish a related art journal, though the latter was never to be published. first group show in the spring of 1874, Degas exhibited ten pictures and generally received good reviews. The exhibition as a whole, though, was a failure. It received savage attacks in the press, had poor attendances, and the limited sales led to the collapse of the cooperative. Two years later, they tried again, this time at the Duand Royale Gallery. This time, Degas had 22 works in the exhibition. Again, the press was divided, but even his detractors saw Degas as the leader of a movement, as well as an individualist. The subsequent exhibitions of 1877, 79 and 80 showed increasing acclaim that testified to a newfound appreciation of Degas' art and to his special place within the group. Degas used a wide variety of mediums for his work, oil paint and the usual drawing mediums, but also pastel. Pastel allowed him to work spontaneously because it's dry, and he was able to make changes because it's opaque. This made it ideal for an artist who liked to work quickly, but who also liked to retouch the same picture over and over again. He began experimenting with pastel, and he started using very wild colors to paint his, again, ballet dances behind the scenes. And this may have been because his eyesight had deteriorated, so he wasn't perhaps aware that he was using such bright colours. What Degas did was he would take the, the pastel and melt it back down again. Uh, and very often he, he, he uh, would sort of boil it up overnight, turn it, turn it into a, uh, like a porridge, and use that as a form of paint. When it then dried... Uh, it reverted to the texture of pastel, uh, but gave him an underpainting from which he could draw more pastel on, uh, on, on top of this, so that his, his use of pastel was very much more experimental uh, than had become hitherto. This powder of a butterfly's wings made it a perfect medium for portraying the elusiveness of subjects like cafe performers or ballet dancers. If there is a point where Degas becomes the painter of dancers, it is now. He turns out a large number of dance scenes using a wide range of techniques. He follows them backstage and into drab rehearsal rooms, away from the lights of the stage. He shows us dancers warming themselves, stretching, chatting, his observations were sharp and uncompromising. These were not great beauties. We see their chaperone mothers, dark-suited ticket holders, and the movement of tutus and the color of the bows at their waists. I think that Degas saw in the girls some sort of kindred spirit to the way how he himself worked, that his work required uh, years of uh, dedicated practice before he could gain any kind of proficiency in it. And that was the same within the dancers. 
and he actually became a very uh, close friend to many of them and um, they regarded him as a rather amiable but perhaps slightly eccentric old gentleman. In the course of the 1880s, Degas' life went through many changes. At the beginning of the decade, he was still weighed down by family debts. But by the time he moved in 1890, he was into a huge three-story apartment, complete with his ever-growing collection of old master paintings. But the 1880s also brought one distressing loss after another. Manet died in 1883. His friend, Giuseppe De Nittis, the following year, as well as a school friend, Alfred Neode. During this decade, the Impressionist exhibitions continued and still stood as major events in the art calendar. However, Degas' role in organising them was coming under increasing criticism. Paul Gauguin didn't trust him and feared he might sabotage the exhibitions. His chief criticism and one shared to some extent by Pizarro and others, came from Degas' insistence on including some of his friends in the exhibitions. As a result, in 1882, Degas paid his dues but exhibited nothing of his own. And at the last Impressionist exhibition in 1886, he hung only ten of the fifteen canvases he listed in the catalogue. All ten, however, won great critical acclaim. A series of female nudes shown bathing, drying themselves and combing their hair caused more of a stir than Surratt's famous Sunday afternoon on the island of the Grand Jet, which we now hail as the jewel of the 1886 exhibition. Relations between Degas and his one-time co-exhibitors became more and more difficult. However, Pizarro's admiration for him stayed intact despite the many rebuffs, Degas' difficult temperament and the virulent anti-Semitism he showed in later years. Degas showed less and less enthusiasm for Monet's work, though, describing him as more a businessman than an artist and a man who turned up nothing but beautiful decorations. Degas, for his part, began to focus his art more and more on women. We see them trying on hats in milliners' shops, at ironing boards, in tutus on stage taking a bow, or backstage rehearsing a step and fastening a shoulder strap. He painted them alone in their rooms, washing, dressing their hair, toweling themselves dry. We often don't see their faces, unself-conscious about their nudity, caught by the artist thinking they're unobserved. When Degas painted these women, his portrayal of them was considered cruel because they were so true to life. Some maintained, and others continue to maintain, that Degas was a voyeur who saw women as animals. His attitude to women seems to me to be disinterested in them as sexual objects. He sees them as objects in space, in movement. And this whole business of unchoreographed, that is, what the photographer would say, the, 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 the behind the scenes, a snapshot view, something which particularly uh, appealed to him. Uh, and so his whole series of works on uh, women dr uh, bathing or drying takes people in an attitude which would, they would not normally be seen, and indeed would not normally be exhibited. And it is this exploration of, of this that's important. He wanted to show the women he was painting as he saw them, his women in the baths. For example, the one where the woman is in the bath and you, you're looking down on her and you've got on your right this dressing table. It sort of cuts her off. Again, he's separating himself and us from the woman. And she is part of her background, if you like, part of her surroundings. And that's what he's interested in, not showing her as a sexual object at all, just as a, a person.
In the last decade of the century, the artist was slowly turning in on himself, opting for seclusion. From 1890, he began to see less and less of his friends, and in 1892, was no longer seen at ballet rehearsals. He authorized fewer and fewer exhibitions of his work, and through a bitterness with growing old, slowly cut himself off from everything. His work routine was much the same, however, painting in the studio until the evening, and then a plain meal prepared by his faithful housekeeper, Zoe Clausier. Sometimes he went to dinner at an old friend's house, and he continued to summer with his circle of old friends. Many old contemporaries died in quick succession, leaving Degas more and more isolated. Berta Morisot died in 1895, Toulouse-Lautrec in 1901, Gauguin and Pissarro in 1903, and Cezanne in 1906. His circle of relatives and close friends also shrank with a succession of deaths contributing to a growing solitariness. Then came the Dreyfus Affair. In 1894, a French army officer, Alfred Dreyfus, a Jew and an innocent man, was convicted of treason and sentenced to life on the notorious Devil's Island. The case became a major political issue for over a decade, dividing France into anti-Semites and royalists on one hand and anti-clerical Dreyfus supporters on the other. From the start, Degas was on the side of the royalists and did not refrain from making anti-Semitic remarks. Degas, we need to understand, was very right-wing and he was very anti-Semitic. And uh, the fact that Dreyfus, there was any indication that she, he was betraying his country, but he was also Jewish. But then he was found that it, that it entirely false. The accusations were false, or at least they were dropped. Uh, which left Degas rather high and dry. The sad fact that he was indeed an anti-Semite remains one of the most disconcerting and troubling aspects of this great man. I think it did not reflect very well on him personally. But um, that was the nature of the man. This was the, the person he was, in a sense. And I don't think it, in a way, affected the relationship that he had with his friends. Uh, nor really did it affect... Um, any, any appreciation of his art or uh, uh, of, of the way how his paintings were beginning to sell at the time. During the 1890s, Degas channeled most of his enthusiasm into expanding his personal art collection. Such was his intensity for collecting, it began to worry some of his friends that it would lead to bankruptcy. He was purchasing the showpieces that would turn him into one of the most important collectors of his day. He bought Gauguin's and El Greco and work by Delacroix in a very short space of time. I buy and I buy, he said. I can't stop myself any more. In 1895, another enthusiasm took hold, photography. He bought a camera, most likely an Eastman Kodak No. 1, and used it with, as one friend put it, the same energy he put into everything he did. He used a tripod and glass plates, as he was not interested in the world of the snapshot. He photographed at night, after he'd finished in the studio, which allowed him to explore the atmosphere of lamps and moonlight. His carefully positioned models would have to keep still for a long time, in an eerie, inscrutable space, giving them a spectral-like appearance. Photography was something which, which was very important as the 19th century progressed. Um, it was seen as a severe threat to some traditional artistic things like portraiture, uh, and certainly uh, most artists uh, were, were affected by it. Some simply tried to ignore it. But others like Degas, and he was unusual in this, actually leapt upon it as providing him with even further information about movement. And this is the key to an understanding of some of the um, works that he was producing. What he liked about photography was the fact that it would catch, really catch, the passing minute. And so it inspired him, I believe. And of course, since he retreated to his...